Beginning in the second half of the 19th century, China underwent radical and dramatic changes. However, in the 1920s, when the rest of the world was still in the grip of post-war turmoil, Shanghai, known then as Pearl of the Orient, seemed to be a carefree city, a city with neon lights, its hustle and bustle proudly proclaiming its prosperity. However, starting as early as 1919, something new was brewing. In June 1921, a passenger ship called the Aquila docked on the banks of the Huangpu River. And off its deck emerged a Dutchman, dressed in fine clothes, wearing neat gold-rimmed glasses and going by the pseudonym Anderson. And he posed as a reporter stationed in Shanghai for a Japanese magazine called The Oriental Economist. Anderson was watched from the moment he arrived in Shanghai. Moreover, there was a Chinese man who had been expecting his arrival. This was Chen Doxiu, one of the earliest proponents of Marxism in China, and a man who's now become part of Shanghai folklore. In 1919, when Chen Doxiu was in Peking University, together with a group of social elites like Li Dazhao, he launched the May the Fourth Movement, which was to protest against the Treaty of Versailles. In the early spring of 1920, Chen, who had been forced back to Shanghai from Beijing, moved into a house at number two Dao Yu Yangli on Huanlong Road. Coming with him also was the editorial house of Xin Qingnian. From that time onward, many elites in Shanghai started to gather around him. Xin Qingnian was an incredibly influential monthly magazine first published in 1915 and promoting revolution, scientific thinking and democracy. It may seem unbelievable that a magazine could have had such widespread appeal. Shanghai, though, had become a focal point for the exchange of ideas between East and West. It was partly thanks to Shanghai's advanced publishing and printing industry that it was able to foster this atmosphere. Now I'm at number two Yu Yangli on Nanchang Road in the former French concession and where Chen Doxiu used to live and was also the editorial house of Xin Qingnian and a key location where preparation work for the establishment of the CPC was undertaken. Mr. Zhao and his family have been living in the house for the last 40 years. <laughs> As I continued my exploring, a group of people came to my attention. At the beginning of summer in this same year, around the same time as this Dutchman Anderson arrived, a mysterious group from Beijing also appeared on the scene. Now, there were about, well, more than 10 of them, and they said they were students traveling for the summer. But in fact, they all spoke with different regional accents, and they came and stayed right here in this girls' school. And the reason why they chose Bo Wen Girls' School as the place to stay made me realize another key concept, concession zone. From 1885年有了英主家,後來又陸續有了美主家,法主家,到1863年的時候呢,是英主家跟美主家合兵為公共主家,這兩個主家加上中國地方政府三個政權在管理這樣一個城市,他們用的法律是不一樣的,政府是不一
，在一九二一年，上海已经是处于交通枢纽的位置，因为那个时候呢，叫以机器为动力的轮船，已经在海上面比较顺畅的通行了。像是从上海到天津、到青岛、到广州、到香港的、到日本、到东南亚的这个航路都非常之顺畅。要开会，要把这个全国，也包括从日本来的人。放到一个地方合适的地方要开会，什么地方最合适了？那就是上海。People started to notice that the young men from Peking were having a lot of communication with the mysterious man from Holland, and so they couldn't help wondering what were they really in Shanghai for, and were they really just college students? Perhaps it's time to reveal the true identity of this Dutchman. 到上海的是共产国际的代表马林，他其实呢就是一个革命领袖，世界革命领袖。他到中国来的使命就是协助中国建立共产党。In fact, when the Third International decided to help China to build its Communist Party organization, Shanghai was not the only potential location. The main concern of the revolutionaries was where in China could the traditional Soviet revolutionary model, sparking revolution among urban proletariat, be realized. Chinese modern workers were first seen in Shanghai. After the Communist Party came, the train arrived in Shanghai. The train had to be repaired. They had to build a communist party. So they had a workers to build a train. Then they developed one by one by one. 那么到了二十年代的时候，上海的工业已经占全国的百分之四十，其中的最多的工厂，上海的工人至少有五十万人，所以这是一个中国革命非常重要的主力军。Dusk has fallen and the lights have come on. It was under cover of darkness that the very first delegates to the very first meeting of the CPC met in secret, right here in this room. They met here night after night, session after session, until the last session when there was a knock at the door and a mysterious and sinister stranger came in and interrupted them. Well, that last session may have been interrupted, but the chain of events and the history that these sessions initiated has not been interrupted. Right up to the present day. The right time, the right place, the right people brought a whole series of historic processes to a head, and resulted in the foundation of the Communist Party of China right here in Shanghai. We now look back on this, of course, as a major historic turning point. But at the time, the fledgling political party had enormous and daunting challenges to face. When we now turn our heads back in history and look at the incredible difficulties, the incredible hardship, the bloodshed, the violence, the warfare that this party had to face, we can really say that this was only a beginning.